happy to be here at the OFA conference, or rather in my car, um, recording from outside a local business with high-speed internet. Um, yeah, rural, rural internet and COVID, and this is the best I could come up with. So I'm, uh, yeah, thanks for joining me. Looking forward to talking about a topic I love with you all. Um, so without further ado, um, let's talk about mulberries. Um, so I just want to give a, a brief overview of what this um, presentation is going to look like. I want to give a little background about myself and my farm, um, some projects I'm involved with, and then we'll uh, get an overview of mulberry, look at a few different species, and then we'll talk about leaf production, fruit production, um, potential diseases, and then how I'm using mulberry on my farm, and we'll brainstorm some ideas for how this might benefit all of you. Um, so again, thanks for joining me. Um, my name is Weston Lombard. Um, I'm the owner of Solid Ground Farm. Um, Solid Ground Farm is it's sort of, it's like a sort of research and um, education slash recreation center. Um, we're in Southeast Ohio, um, Appalachian hilly, hilly land. And uh, we do um, workshops and educational programs and have this experimental agroecology, agroforestry. Um, I've been doing this for about 12 years. And I'd say I, I got into this idea through I guess sort of through philosophy and like looking for purpose and meaning in my life, trying to find greater connection with nature. Um, I just I just wanted to find a way that I could like interact with the outdoors in a beneficial way. So that led me to agroforestry and permaculture. Um, I started experimenting and researching and uh, eventually hosting workshops so that I could learn learn more about certain topics. From that, I sort of developed different speaker series and weekend events and all this stuff at the farm um, as a way to, to sort of fund my um, my harm, farming hobby. Um, so that's grown over the years and now we, we offer um, several different programs and most of our income actually comes from renting space to the summer camp and uh, place-based elementary school. Um, we do also, we've, we've got a CSA, we sell direct to consumer, um, but at this point I'd say 10% of our income comes from actually selling produce and most of it comes from rents and rent. Um, and that has allowed me to play around without a lot of um, expectation and give me freedom to explore different crops. So that's sort of how I have come to Mulberry anyway, through this experiment. Um, briefly about the different programs, we offer this uh, Youth Outdoor Adventure Summer Camp. We're trying to connect children with the outdoors, show them meaningful um, interactions with nature and help them build relationships with the land and each other. Um, they spend a lot of time foraging through, I've got forest gardens and um, vegetable gardens and all this, and they, you know, pick carrots and eat them and hang out under the mulberry tree. And, um, most of the fruit on the farm actually gets eaten by kids at the summer camp or, or at like, uh, we do a hundred person farm to table festival and a lot of the food gets processed for that. Um, the rest of the year we have a, um, place-based elementary school and sort of like outdoor focused. Um, we do projects around seasonal happenings at the farm. I run a eco entrepreneurship class by do projects like make apple cider or roast chestnuts and hazelnuts. Um, now we're making acorn cookies and elderberry. Um, so a lot of fun, um, but all of these projects together have this focus on like I guess building culture around uh, the local sourcing of our food and basic needs. Um, so we're trying to 
to think of ways to interact and have a relationship with, with our land um, as if, as if you know, we belong there and as if we're part of this ecosystem. So we're developing our, our role and how we fit with all the uh, sun, soil, water, and plants and animals, fungi. Um, super experimental, super fun. Um, on this process, um, like I said, I experimented with a lot of different crops, um, but gradually came to notice that the most productive and most consistent crop on the farm were the wild mulberries growing like underneath the walnut trees and along the fence rows. And that was actually where we were getting the best production. Um, so I slowly started looking at different cultivars and planting more and more trees. Um, eventually I applied for a, a SARE grant and got funding to uh, collect local and regional cultivars and test them out on the farm. So I, I planted probably 50 cultivars. Um, who knew there were so many different types of mulberry, um, but I, I've tried them all at this point um, and have been planting different configurations, doing different pruning methods, and really trying to learn everything I can about this underappreciated crop. So that's where I'm coming from. Um, I'm gonna try to share everything I've, I've learned and read about mulberries in this brief time. Um, so I'm gonna jump right into it here. Um, in case you don't know, uh, mulberry, um, it's, a you know deciduous at least in temperate climates tree from the Moraceae family, uh, it's the same family as figs, breadfruit, and Osage orange. These are all very vigorous, um, adaptable trees. Um, mulberry is typically uh, dioecious, meaning it has male and female flowers on different trees. Um, only female trees produce um, something to be aware of. Male trees produce a large amount of pollen that can trigger some people's allergies. But anyway, back to the, the tree in general. Why, why are we going to plant mulberry trees? Um, I was first exposed to um, mulberry in literature in J. Russell Smith's book, Tree Crops, A Permanent Agriculture. He calls mulberry uh, the king of crops without a throne. It's not yet been recognized for its potential. And the re some of the reasons it's so great are, um, one, it is, it is very um, vigorous growing and adaptive. The mulberry is found worldwide um, in most areas that, you know, that are not Arctic. Um, it, can it can survive in, in wet soils and dry soils, um, on mountaintops, on most conditions there is a species of mulberry that will survive. Um, there are actually 200 species of mulberry worldwide and uh, thousands of cultivars. Today, we're gonna to talk particularly about two species, um, the native Morris rubra and the imported uh, Morris album. Um, so adaptable, vigorous, and also very precocious, meaning it, it bears fruit at a young age. Um, a grafted tree that you get from a nursery will start bearing immediately. Uh, it'll have a few fruit on it, even in, a, in, a, in the pot. And then increasing in production until about, it takes till about five years when it reaches like good production. And then will continue to increase over its life. Um, they say a mature mulberry tree can produce 10 bushels of fruit. And, uh, some of the challenges are uh, actually getting all of that fruit, um, but we'll talk more about that later. Um, delicious edible fruit. Um, people say it resembles a blackberry. Um, the fruit varies in, in flavor from bland and really sweet to tangy and complex, um, depending on the cultivar. Um, it's typically soft and bruises easily. Um, so that's actually one of, the, one of the reasons we don't see mulberry more commonly in a supermarket or something are because of its short shelf. Um, so these are the two reasons most commonly attributed to lack of, of prominence is, is one that it uh, 
has a short shelf life and two, the birds love it and tend to gorge themselves and then leave purple marks all over your backyard. And so there's that to consider. Um, beyond that, mulberry is super nutritious. Um, so is worth is worth growing just for its health benefits. Um, J. Russell Smith writes about villages in the Middle East where they actually harvest mulberries in the summer, um, dry them to preserve them, and then eat them as almost a sole food source through the winter. They're really high in protein and all these different vitamins and minerals and can actually like sustain someone as a meal on their own. This bottom picture is some mulberries that I dehydrated. They're, they're quite delicious. You can buy them now. They're marketed as like a superfood. Most of them come from Turkey and they're uh, sold for like five to $15 an ounce dehydrated. So this, these benefits are, are uh, in the fruit and the leaves are also super healthy. Um, it's been used as like a medicinal Chinese um, remedy for, for thousands of years. And there are a lot of claims as to its health. I think it's being looked at most as uh, that antioxidant reservatrol has anti-cancer properties. Um, I know there's research about um, influencing blood pressure and helping with diabetes by eating mulberry fruit and using leaf tea. Um, it's also said to... Uh, increase uh, brown fat content in our body. So brown fat is what babies are born with. That it keeps them extra warm and it has a lot of energy in it. You can build up your stores by gorging on mulberries in the in the summertime. Um, like I said, we're going to focus on Morris Alba and Morris Rubra. So Alba is the, the white mulberry. Um, don't be fooled by the name. The fruit can actually be white, pink, purple, and even red. Um, there's often confusion about this and people sell uh, what is labeled as Morris Rubra because it has red fruit. That's not necessarily the case. Morris Alba uh, comes from the Himalayas and has been cultivated for thousands of years by particularly the Chinese and later in India. Um, for silkworm production. The leaves are the sole food source of the um, silkworms have very high um, nutritional demand and, and they can only eat mulberry. Um, they have a single stomach like we do. Um, so this food, it's like very digestible and very high in protein and nutrients. So it's also great as, uh, as a livestock and human food. Um, Alba is interesting. Um, it was brought to the U.S. to try to start a silk industry in the 1600s. Uh, there's a great story about that. Um, we went through a, a phase of mulberry mania where individual mulberry trees were being sold for thousands of dollars on the speculation that they would produce amazing silk. And there was a big craze that eventually burst um, when the silk industry didn't pan out. Uh, and that was for a number of reasons. I think labor costs in the US were too high and uh, we just didn't have the quality control that other countries were implementing. Um, so millions of trees were planted over that 200 year period. And in some places they were even mandating that every landowner had to plant uh, mulberry trees. These trees, uh, the seed is easily dispersed by birds when they eat the fruit and poop it out and it has since naturalized and spread across the country. It's now considered invasive. Um, that's, I think, worth a discussion. I don't want to discount Morris Alba out of hand because of its invasiveness. Um, it's a very useful tree and it, uh, unlike other invasives, it doesn't typically form like pure stands and it doesn't necessarily outcompete native species. Um, so while it does spread and will show up along fence lines and um, other areas that aren't mowed. It, uh, its main concern is that it hybridizes with the native Morris rubra, um, and these hybrid offspring um, then replace Morris rubra in the wild. Morris rubra is now threatened. 
may even not really exist in pure forms already. Most genetic testing has shown that that almost all wild specimens of Morris rubra have some alba in them at this point after 200 years of. Um, so if you are really, um, yeah, concerned about introducing an invasive species, you should check in your area and see the, the status of Morris alba. If it's already there, um, there's not much that's going to change that, um, but you may not want to introduce it where it doesn't exist. Morris alba, however, there are, it is the, the one that has been bred for the longest, it's been cultivated to have bigger, um, more productive leaves um, for the silk industry. And these can be fed to livestock and humans. So leaf cultivars are the alba. It has smoother leaves than the palatable uh, rubra's leaves can carry. So when we're talking about livestock feed, we're typically talking about Morris alba. Um, it's also yeah great for people. They they steam the leaves like you would grape leaves, like wrap them up in wrap rice and meat and then steam them. Um, and just eat the eat the young ones uh, steamed, but quite healthy and delicious. There's also a market for the root root bark is used in Chinese medicine. It's been used by native people all over. Uh, Alba. It's typically smaller, maybe growing 25 feet tall, 20 feet wide. Um, it can be um, cut and regrows vigorously. Um, and it, it forms this really dense tree, like in the picture here. And even in the middle of this tree where little sunlight penetrates, it still ripens fruit. Um, so that's something special about mulberries. It's like exceptional fruiting. Um, additionally, it fruits. Um, all species almost every year without fail, which makes it um, worth growing just for that for that reason. This was the first year in, in 10 years that I haven't gotten fruit, and we actually had three consecutive late frosts. Um, so it, 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 it leafed out. Um, the flowers and leaves were frozen and killed. It leafed out again and produces secondary flowers, which is is very unique. Those were frozen. I leafed out again, produced tertiary flowers. So it really, it wants to make fruit, uh, but then those were also killed. And at this point um, in the summer, I, I think I got like three or four fruits from um, a hundred tree. Um, so it, it has its limits, but it will do its best to fruit. It typically leafs out later than most fruit trees. So, it, so it's not usually an issue, but with climate change, everything is sort of crazy. Um, so again, grafted trees, rooted cuttings, they'll fruit right away. A seedling will take uh, maybe five years before it fruits. So that's Alba. This is Morris rubra, or likely a hybrid um, in this picture, but it's native to Ohio. Um, these trees get quite large. They're found um, usually along stream banks or in forest coves. They can tolerate uh, wet soils and can actually like be flooded and underwater for a year um, and then bounce back the next year if the water recedes. However, after two years, they'll die. Um, they don't like to be, they don't like to be in the water and like a well-drained soil. Um, but they'll uniquely they tolerate alkaline soils and wet soils, and they do better in shade than alba. Um, the rubra. Between rubra and alba, you can almost plant in any situation. Alba likes more of the drier soils. A rubra can tolerate the wet. Um, alba, the more acidic. Rubra um, has um, both more complex, better tasting fruit, often bigger fruit. Um, it also has you know, established relationships with our native ecology. Um, so it's a great wildlife feed for its uh, about a dozen, maybe I think it's nine caterpillar species that it supports, um, dozens of mammals. Uh, this isn't a picture of mine, but I actually came out to a tree and there was a woodchuck in the tree out um, eating, I think, the, brand, the fruit and the leaves off the tree. And so 
um, all all man, manner of creature uh, love mulberry fruit. It's um, they can be hard to distinguish, especially with all the, the hybridization. Um, typically, uh, the rubra will have bigger, um, more deeply lobed leaves that are slightly hairy on the underside. Uh, they're duller green and not glossy like like the alba. And you can actually go to this website and they'll they'll do side by side comparisons. Bark is actually quite distinctly different too with this grayish bark on the rubra and the alba it almost turns an orangish color as it ages. Um, and you saw the, the cut down pictures of the stump, the heartwood is actually like this bright yellowish orange color on the alba. Here's a chart that shows um, the differences. Um, but typical rule of thumb, if you find it in a forest, like in the middle of a forest, it, it likely it could be red mulberry. If you find it in town or like growing along a fence line, it's probably white mulberry. Um, but yeah, they do have some distinct, distinct differences. Uh, red mulberry will never have white fruit, whereas white mulberry will. Um, so which one to plant? It depends. If you're not a purist, there are more options. A lot of the hybrids are some of the best fruit producing. What I like to do is plant out red mulberry seedlings um, and then graft um, hybrids and red mulberry cultivars on. However, if I were doing it for Leaf production, I would I would do alba. Um, Morris nigra, uh, also uh, originating in Asia, uh, is supposed to have the best tasting fruit of all the mulberries, and this is what uh, typical mulberry orchards in Europe and the UK are, are of Morris nigra, um, and they unfortunately I think it's more the humidity of our winter that they don't tolerate. Um, they can they can do up to like six B I think but but typically uh, I think Nigra would be a gamble here I haven't even tried it just because of what I read that it wouldn't work um, but maybe in certain circumstances it'd be worth trying um, but we weren't we aren't going to discuss Nigra anymore but um, we could okay so getting into mulberry leaves. Um, uh, like I said, almost all livestock, I can't think of any that would not enjoy mulberry leaves from rabbits to chickens. You might have to dry dry it and grind it to uh, chickens to eat it. Pigs will strip the leaves right off of the tree, as will goats and sheep. Um, it's often collected on um, the young shoots and then run through a wood chipper and you are a shredder and you can feed that whole whole all of that to cattle. They'll eat, they'll eat the bark and the young sheep. Lots of nutrition from that as well. People compare it to alfalfa um, and say it's it's more nutritious than alfalfa. So if you're trying to compare it to something else, um, there's lots of studies showing it increases milk production in goats, increases egg production in chickens. Um, it can, it's typically not fed as a as a a lone food source, but in combination with other. Um, um, but it's a great addition. So um, there's some studies you can check out. I. Um, I don't know a lot of the science behind it, but I do know that the leaves are very high in different, different minerals, nutrients, and actually have a lot of protein. So they're very high quality forage. How I've been using them is uh, both for human consumption. Um, I collect um, the young leaves and dehydrate them and then use them to make tea. I drink a mulberry leaf tea every day. Um, I'm sure it's really healthy. Uh, who, who knows? But it's it's got a pleasant taste. Um, and 
fetches a very good price. So if you just look online, uh, it retails for seven ounces, seven dollars an ounce. Um, I'm sure it wholesales for a lot less, but a tree makes an absurd amount of leaves. You can harvest in the tropics. They harvest leaves up to like seven times a year. Um, in temperate climates, I think we can do two leaf harvestings. Um, so you strip the tree and then it um, leafs out and grows again. You strip the leaves again and then it leafs out again and hardens off before winter. You can get a lot of crop from it. Um, stripping the leaves also when it leaps back out it produces fruit again so it's a way to stimulate a second round of fruiting as well um, how we care for the mulberry depends on whether you're um, growing it for fruit or for leaves um, and as does the spacing and whatnot um, which i guess i will get into uh, momentarily after i i show the proof of my statements here. Um, this is uh, our pet, our pet sheep um, enjoying mulberry leaves. Um, so I have these growing in the pasture as like shade trees. And then I'll either just break and bend the branches down so they're in, in reach or I'll cut them um, and bring them into their paddock if that's the case. Um, so these two lived mostly off mulberry leaves um, through this winter. Um, actually, I, I cut them in the summer and bring them whole branches. And uh, what they didn't need, I dried in my tree. Sorry, technical difficulties. But yeah, so I, I cut it and then I just put it in a shed to dry. Um, and it stays green and just dehydrates so it doesn't mold or spoil. Uh, they call it tree hay. And you just have to like somehow get it in an area with some ventilation and it'll dry out. And then you can feed that all through the winter as a supplement. Um, so I've been experimenting with that. And I find that they, they definitely relish the, the mulberry leaves in all seasons. Add it to pigs and sheep primarily. Um, so leaf cultivars are uh, very widely available uh, in other countries. Um, here, most nurseries sell uh, fruit fruit cultivars, um, and these are some that I've found uh, to be suitable. Although uh, there are definitely better ones out there, I just don't know how to access them. So Kokusa um, is one that's bred in Korea. Um, it has really big uh, fruit and also really big palatable leaves. Um, some leaves uh, strip really well off a tree. Kokusa actually like pulls some bark with it when you strip it, so it's better for like a, uh, cutting the branches and carrying them. Armin is another Alba cultivar that has big fruit and big leaves. There are often a correlation between the two. Um, if you want to do this on the cheap, you can get more Alba seedlings. Um, and again, half will be males and half will be females, but all of them will have uh, nutritious leaves. So yeah, I'd love to get my hands on some cold, hardy um, leaf cultivars. Um, I know there's ones that have higher nutritional content and more protein, higher digestibility and all that, but um, not yet available. Um, so for leaf production, typically they do sort of a, uh, a tight spacing. Um, this is from uh, a book on mulberry cultivation by an Indian author. Um, uh, th this hasn't really been done in the U.S., so there's not like a lot of information on how do you grow mulberries for leaves in the U.S. So this is sort of an extrapolation from temperate uh, India. They're doing it. So they do a three by three spacing, um, irrigated and fertilized, and they. Um, yeah, yield six to nine tons um, an acre of leaves. As the soil gets less ideal, the slope steeper, you might consider a 10 by 10 spacing. And so, so with this tight spacing, you can imagine uh, the trees, you know, 20 foot trees, how's that work? Um, well, you either coppice it or pollard it. Um, and these are both great strategies for, they both increase the longevity, the life lifetime of a tree, 
and they continuously keep it within uh, a harvesting height and allow for uh, multiple year after year harvests. So the first step is you plant your trees, you let them grow for a few years to get established, and then you cut them at different heights depending on what you're going for. Um, so this is an example of a pollard. Pollarding is essentially um, cutting them at above livestock or deer browse um, so that the new growth isn't eaten off by, by some sort of animal. Um, so in the, you plant it. Uh, sorry, my pictures are sort of hard to see. You plant it in the first year, prune the lower branches to try to get a straight trunk. Um, keep doing that in the second year. And then in the third year, when you've got a you know, four inch or so diameter tree, um, you cut it down at, at four or five feet. Um, and then that will, um, you cut it down, sorry, in, in the winter when it's dormant. Um, and then in the spring, it will shoot up all manner of regrowth from the top. You let these grow for uh, a month or so, two months, and then you cut them all down and carry that leaf um, to your livestock or strip the leaves off um, and dehydrate them, whatever you're going to do. Um, let it regrow. And then you can even, um, second time, you can cut it again or strip the leaves again. Um, and as long as you give it a month or two um, before the last frost to recover and store up energy for next year, um, you can do this year after year. Um, this will obviously uh, pull nutrients from the soil, so you'll have to fertilize and irrigate if you're doing this continuously. Um, you can also do it once a year and have less of an impact on the land and less need for what you um, this next picture is a coppice system, uh, same idea. You're uh, letting the tree grow and establish, put down big roots for, for three to four years, and then you're cutting it down at the base. Um, this, uh, there's systems where you can harvest mechanically that I think uh, prefer like a coppice method. method. Um, and then how you prune these, uh, how you make the cuts is sort of you cut it down. It has all these vigorous sprouts growing. Um, and then you cut them uh, not flush against the trunk, but just leaving like a, you know, a, a centimeter of a stub. Um, and these, it sort of grows over time and you get this gnarly like hand looking thing. And each year it gets a little more bulbous and funny looking. So it's constantly sort of growing a little bit as you're coppicing it. Um, and coppice trees, um, I don't know about mulberry in particular, but coppice trees um, can live for like thousands of years. Continuously supply leaves, or if you let it grow longer, um, people weave with, with mulberry or use the, the inner bark for fiber. Um, let it grow even longer between cutting and get big diameter uh, pole wood for, for firewood or um, fence posts even. I think the heartwood of Mort's rubra, um, fairly rot resistant. Um, so anyway, coppicing and pollarding are a great way to increase um, production. All right, so turning to fruit. Um, so this has been my my main interest. Uh, the fruit, like I said, it's it's delicious, it's nutritious, it's very versatile. Um, anything you can do with like blackberries or something you can do with mulberries. So wine, pies, jam, jellies, juices. Um, I did a lot of smoothies. Mostly what I did was I froze a lot of fruit and I'd throw it in the smoothies or put it in pancakes. I did, did a little experiment with dehydration. Um, I want to get a, it'd be nice to find a system that was outdoor, uh, uses a lot of energy and takes like I think 12 hours in a commercial dehydrator to dehydrate it. Um, but then they're shelf stable. Um, it's a great, a great thing, thing to do. Um, so fruit um, is ideal for humans and, and livestock, particularly pigs and chickens. 
Um, so I've experimented with this and I have found that the animals will hang out under the mulberry trees waiting for the fruit to drop and then do a great job of cleaning it up um, and, and fattening themselves on its production. Um, kids, of course, love mulberries. Um, we talked a little bit about the challenges, um, birds, short shelf life. Um, so really um, harvesting it for market or something, I would hand pick it um, directly into the sale containers and then like take it that day or the next day to be sold and tell consumers to eat it, you know, right away, pretty much. Um, the most reasonable thing I think is to do a you pick where people come and eat it directly from the um, So to do this, it's important to um, keep the trees small. Uh, Morris rubra can grow up to 75 feet if not pruned. Um, so there's going to be, and it's vigorous, so it grows a lot each year. So there's going to be a lot of, a lot of pruning, uh, which means a lot of leaves to share and a lot of wood to burn. Um, so it's, it's a very giving and productive tree and you have to do what you can to keep it, keep it small and within reach. Um, another interesting thing about mulberry is its uh, ripening window. So a typical mulberry tree might have a two to three week ripening window where every day um, a little bit of fruit ripens for the whole crop on over three weeks. Um, some hybrids uh, called uh, everbearing cultivars will ripen uh, small batches continuously for maybe three months. Or maybe they'll have a, a season in June and then they'll have another little season in in August or something. You can, if you plant a lot of different cultivars, you can have a really long mulberry season lasting from June through August. The harvesting. Um, and then with, with like one cultivar, I know Cocusa is the one that they sort of ripen together over a two week period um, and can be harvested more all at once. Um, so here's just some kids at the camp um, doing what they do every day at pickup. So you can see there's there's quite a bit of fruit um, on each on each tree. Um, yeah, so it's very it's very productive, um, and again. Um, I, I, I love the taste. Mulberries are delicious. Let's look at how we're going to train and prune them for fruit. Um, so this is sort of what I've been going for is uh, branches spreading out um, that I can walk under. The fruit hangs underneath and I want to be able to walk all around the tree or at least bend the branches down where I can um, where I can reach them. So I've achieved that um, primarily through bending the branches. So I just sort of take them and like crimp them as I go. And I've noticed uh, that typically that the Alba cultivars uh, respond well to bending and they're quite pliable. Um, occasionally with the rubra, I, uh, I end up like ripping, they tear at a crotch and break when I try to bend them. Um, so I think they're less conducive to bending. Um, I don't know if that's true generally across the species, but that's been my observation. Um, so bending helps uh, keep them horizontal and promote this like um, lateral growth and fruit production. Um, what ends up happening though is when you bend the branch then the next year it shoots up a bunch of vertical growth above that so that has to constantly be managed um, yeah here's another tree so the the malt, malt they can be multi-stemmed um just try and try and when they're young to create this shape and then i can sort of leave this scaffold structure and just do annual or um, biannual pruning to uh, keep it small like this so I've got another diagram I've drawn. Um, hopefully, as well. Um, so first thing you want to do is get it, um, get the branches sort of above 
a deer brow tight. So you prune it up to a, to a straight whip, um, cut off the young branches. And then uh, a heading cut at the top will encourage it to send out a lot of branches right at the tip of the tree. And then those you want to bend over um, to create this nice scaffolding. And that can be done by here. The people you use bamboo or two by fours to tie the branches to and try to get them down. I've seen people hang weights or cinder blocks um, from the trees to bring them down. And you can also do that bending method. And so after that is established, then every year, It'll send up these vertical shoots. Um, and what I've been experimenting with is letting the tree fruit. So in June, I'll uh, come into har harvest the fruit and I'll just I'll cut the vertical growth, um, pull it down, take the fruit off, and then I can feed the branches to the livestock. Um, and that sort of keeps the tree from taking off vigorously up in the air. And if you do that every year, um, cutting out the vertical growth, it'll keep sending up these suckers every year. Um, it'll need cut, but it'll also really develop strong lateral branches that you leave. Even the downward facing branches will grow a lot of fruit, like uh, mother called mother fruit. Mm -hmm. What I've seen a lot of people doing in Asian countries is developing these uh, mulberry tunnels. So it's essentially um, maybe 10 to 15 foot spacing and you're training the branches in towards each other. Um, and then you walk underneath the harvest as you go. So that'd be really great for a, a UPIC is creating one of these mulberry tunnels. Um, another great way I've, I've seen this done is managing it uh, more like that coppice system where you have um, a multi-stem trunk that you're periodically um, cutting back. So you might cut half, half the, the shoots one year and then half the shoots the next year. Um, so you're just continuously keeping it small, but allowing an amount of it to, to harvest. But that is the biggest challenge is you want to keep it small so that you can harvest the fruit. What cultivars are best for fruit production? Um, as part of my SARE grant, I wrote a booklet uh, that contains a lot of this information. Um, I, I, I need to update it. Um, so cultivars that did well during that period, we've since had some really cold winters and, and they have died. Um, so here's a, a, a list of, of cultivars suitable for like zone five um, that I've really liked. My favorite is actually a local one that I got from uh, our farmer's market manager named Kip Parker. Um, so it's like a rubra hybrid. It has really complex tasting fruit. It's long, maybe an inch and a half long. And it, uh, it has a tangy complex flavor and is very prolific. Um, ripens over a long window. So it's like an ever bearing. Um, so that's the one I've been grafting on to um, a lot of my wild seedlings. So whenever, you know, I find a, a wild tree growing, I'll take a scion and, and graft a female variety onto it. So I get, so I get fruit. The standard is Illinois Everbearing. It's very cold hardy, um, produces tasty, big fruit. Um, if, you know, anyone who's growing mulberry has heard of Illinois Everbearing. Silk Hope uh, is from a town called Silk Hope in North Carolina. It was introduced by A.J. Bullard, um, the late A.J. Bullard, he recently passed away. He was like our regional mulberry expert, uh, you know, very diverse mulberry orchard. Um, he introduced Silk Hope and thought it was the most promising um, mulberry cultivar. A lot like Illinois Everbearing, maybe slightly bigger, maybe slightly better tape. Um, very similar. Uso is that Korean Korean cultivar that ripens precipitously. It's got big black fruit, maybe even bigger than Silk Hope. Um, I like it both because it has big nutritious leaves and it's good fruit production and it ripens all at once. You can just be done with the season quickly. Um, Girardi Dwarf 
is my favorite, but it keeps dying on me when the temperature dips below negative 15 degrees. Um, so it's not quite ideal for us, but it has a short uh, internodal distance. This picture um, is Girardi dwarf. So it has a lot of fruit and a small space and it, it doesn't get as big as other mulberries. Um, very good flavor, very big fruit, naturally small tree. So if, if, if you're in like zone six, uh, I would try Girardi dwarf, great all around. Carmen, uh, if you want a white fruited variety, which uh, the birds tend to leave alone more, Carmen I think has the biggest, uh, best tasting of the white fruited ones that will grow in our area. Um, Capsrum is also car cold hardy. Um, it comes from Canada, I believe. Foliar is super cold hardy as well. Um, so anywhere uh, north north of of where I am, uh, zone zone five and up, the most cold hardy, to my knowledge, are Illinois Everbearing, Pocusa, uh, and Collier. And I imagine Capsule and Carmen, being from Canada, are also like that. Um, this is a great website. Um, it has information on each cultivar and everything you'd like to know um, about mulberries. So that's from Mark Travis. Um, this is a picture from that website as well. Uh, so I was under the impression that mulberry was mostly pest and disease free, which was one of the benefits uh, of planting it. I, I've since learned that nothing is truly without pests and diseases, especially in Southeast Ohio with our humidity, and especially when you start planting a bunch of things together. So that was one of the drawbacks of bringing mulberries from all over the country and planting them together on my farm is that uh, when pests and diseases started showing up. Um, 10 caterpillars, um, you know, you can just scoop them off and smash them. Uh, the birds eat the, eat the fruit. Deer love the leaves. Different caterpillars love the leaves. However, they, they always bounce back. Like leaf defoliation is not a big, big issue. Um, the more problematic ones are the borers which um, I've been educated that the borers uh, should not be a problem if you have healthy trees that are well irrigated and mulched and cared for. That has not been my style of growing. Um, I've planted a lot of things, sort of letting nature take its course, which might not be the best strategy. Um, so I have started getting some borer damage. They, they, drill into the end of the bark and eat the cambium and eventually kill the tree. Um, and the worst problem I've had show up is this fusarium canker that's spread here. Um, it's a fungal disease that spreads by wind and insects and sort of enters uh, leaf scars or areas um, where the bark has been damaged. Um, you can spread it by pruning it starts to eat the eat the cambium, form these sunken cankers, and will eventually spread around the entire branch until it girdles it and kills anything above it. Um, so if that happens on the trunk, it can kill the whole tree. Remedy to fusarium canker um, is first identifying it, and then you cut back six inches below it and burn or of the wood in a sanitary way. Um, so I have now found this in most of my trees and I've been cutting a lot of them down or cutting them back. Extremely bad and unfortunate. Um, but if you get it early, it's no big deal. You cut it out um, and just get rid of it whenever you see it. Um, here are pictures of the borers. Uh, mulberry trees, they tend to bleed when you cut them. Um, so a lot of sap comes out. Um, so the, the little, you can see the little holes and then those holes bleed and then that sap uh, tends to mold and turn this black or white color. But the real damage is inside where those little beetles are eating, eating the inner layer of cambium. Um, so one could potentially spray something toxic on them or you can cut down three. Um, 
The nice thing about cutting down a mulberry tree is that the next year it grows right back and you've got a tree again. So not a huge loss. Okay, so a lot of information to digest there. I know how are we gonna use this on our farms? Um, low hanging fruit, like the easy applications are if you have an existing orchard, um, interplant between them with mulberry. It tolerates part shade. Um, so can fruit underneath uh, overstory. It tolerates, tolerates jug loam from black walnut. Um, so it's particularly good as like a interplant with a large nut tree. So if you got a, a chestnut orchard or a walnut orchard or something like that, even oaks and hickories, um, it can do well in between each tree. Um, another benefit you'll get from it in addition to the increased production is that um, if you let the leaves fall and decompose, uh, rather than feeding them to the livestock, it's a ton of organic matter. It's really nutrient rich and it will like uh, build organic matter in your soil and kickstart the, the biology down there. So it's great for that. There's a, there's a myth that the Chinese held back the Gobi Desert by planting uh, mulberries along the edge and just leaf fall would uh, keep away the desertification by holding in moisture and building organic matter. Um, it's also, I've read a study about how there are bacteria living on the leaves that as water falls on the leaves, these nitrogen fixing bacteria drip off the leaves into the soil and actually add nitrogen to the soil. Um, good, good, good. Anecdotally, uh, I read that it's a good companion plant for apples too, probably for those same reasons of building, building organic matter. So I do in my system, I've got, uh, in between every fruit tree, there's a, a mulberry tree. I've recently planted just a small uh, 200 tree uh, that I'm going to try to make into a mulberry tunnel and do a U-pick. I think that's a great small farm activity. You could have an acre of U-pick mulberry that you train to a mulberry tunnel. Um, fruit is really high value. In fact, it's a good price. You can additionally sell the leaves um, and feed any excess. Um, Planting it exclusively for livestock is also not a bad idea. Um, here, I'll show you some. So here, uh, here's a semi-dwarf apple tree and then a grafted mulberry sort of below it. Um, and so in both directions, there'll be mulberry on all four sides of that apple tree. And my, my orchard is pretty diverse, so it's like, uh, a lot of Asian pears and heirloom apples all interspersed with um, so um, for livestock um, it can be planted in the orchard it's a great shade tree very dense shade um, the fruit fall will be enjoyed by by poultry um, and by, by pigs, um, the leaf fall, even the leaves when they fall in autumn are, are still nutritious and will be gobbled up by, by pigs or goats or sheep. Um, so just having a tree in a pasture is of benefit for a number of reasons, food production, shade, um, increasing the soil biology, all, all of that. But I like the idea of, just, of planting a, a plot of it and, and pollarding it and carrying that to the livestock or dehydrating it as a winter feed source. Um, I think uh, mulberry does, you know, help hold soil in place. So this could be done on a hillside where you can't grow hay necessarily. And just on, on generally degraded soil, mulberry can tolerate that. And so having a patch for water production that's a great idea. Um, let's see some chickens eating uh, mulberries here. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so mulberry is a particularly good um, livestock uh, plant because it, it tolerates uh, high nitrogen content of like fresh chicken manure um, or fresh pig manure um, and readily sucks that up and converts it back into leaves. And so a lot of plants won't tolerate that hot, hot compost, um, but the mulberry loves it. Um, other, other little ideas I've had, uh, I've been planting um, around my livestock fences, um, sort of future replacement posts. Um, every 10 feet around the perimeter of my fence, I put a mulberry. Um, these could later be pollarded and fed, grown directly over the fence um, into the pasture. And then when, when my fence posts rot out in 20 years, I'll have a, a new established a fence row already in place and can string my fence along that. I don't know if we mentioned spacing for fruit production. I like about a 10 foot spacing if you're going to keep them small. Um, if you're just going to let a tree grow, um, it's more like 25 foot spacing because it will get quite big. As you saw in the video with the chickens, the trees get quite large. And if they aren't pruned, uh, most of the fruit will be lost to birds or will fall on the ground for livestock. Um, I get a lot of calls um, from people who have read my Sarah project online and then want, want to know how to establish a mulberry orchard or that sort of thing. Um, the, the method I prefer is um, seedlings are very cheap. You can get them for $2 a piece, you plant out 500 seedlings. Um, two to three years later, you can come through and graft them all to cultivars. What I would do is I would probably, at the same time I planted the seedlings, I would select um, half a dozen cultivars and see, you know, three years later, which cultivars are performing the best. Um, and then you, you'll have um, the scion wood from those trees to cut and graft onto. I like to do a bark inlay graft um, when the trees have like started to leap out in, in the early summer. I think there's a market for leaf tea business domestically. Um, mulberry is great. Here's a bunch of resources I've um, compiled. There's some videos um, of orchards in other countries. I, I have not found a domestic mulberry orchard uh, other than AJ Bullard's. Um, I know I know they're out there, but there doesn't seem to be a commercial mulberry farm yet. Um, you could first. Yeah, these are a lot of documents and resources. I've re recently started a Facebook group uh, for temperate mulberry growers. Um, there's a lot of knowledge knowledgeable people on there, so I encourage you to join. Um, reach out to me by email or phone with questions. I'm always happy to help. Um, here are some nurseries that I support and have purchased from. Um, there are dozens of nurseries out there, but these guys have have the cultivars I've listed. And again, if you find my SARE research project online, uh, take those cultivars with a grain of salt. Um, that a lot of them ended up dying. I'm hoping to update that at some point. Um, here's my contact information. I'm happy to. Um, answer questions. I hope you all enjoyed this. Um, sorry again for being in my car here. Thanks for having me. I'll talk to you later.
thanks for watching everybody um i'm uh yeah happy to answer any questions if you all have anything else on your mind Weston, thanks for a great presentation i i had heard long ago that you could take a branch from a mulberry tree and stick it in the ground and you'd have a, a new tree is that accurate uh, so that is ac accurate if you live in a temperate area with with di or a, a tropical area with different mulberry cultivars. Um, there are some that root here, but it's uh, it's it's more difficult um, than in warmer climates. I've had I've had limited success and only with certain cultivars. Um, they do root uh, fairly well from softwood cuttings taken in like the early summer. There was a question in the chat about maybe dipping them in a rooting hormone, Weston. That, def that definitely helps. Um, but still it's like each cultivar is a little different in how well it roots. And a lot of them don't root well from hardwood cuttings, although, uh, you know, I, I hear people getting like ten percent success from rooting Illinois Everbearing, for example, um, but but much higher higher success rates with with the softwood cuttings and still using a rooting hormone on those as well. I'll ask another one, I, and I apologize if you said this and I missed it. Um, how do you sex the trees? Yeah, so you can't sex them until they start to flower. Um, which could take a few years from a seedling. Um, and the flowers, they're sort of similar looking, um, but if you look closely at them, um, it becomes easy to distinguish. I don't, I don't know that I can describe it very well, um, but you, you'd have to look at a side-by-side -side picture online. But the male flowers uh, sort of look more like they're like uh, little tiny flowers, that uh, open and distribute pollen. And the female ones look more like immature fruit. Like if you can imagine just like really tiny green mulberry fruit. Um, but they're, they're pretty, they look quite similar if you, if you don't have a comparison. Sounds like sexing chickens. <laughs> yeah, it's not as bad as chickens. <laughs> Weston, there are a few more Would questions in the chat. Sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh yeah. Um, so the best way to start them, um, if you're trying to do it yourself, uh, they do start well from seeds. You gotta um, stratify the seed. Um, I I haven't actually had a ton of luck with this. I tried freezing them and saving them for the next year, and then they did not germinate. Um, but I hear they're supposed to germinate well. Um, cuttings are an option. Mostly what I do is I buy seedlings. I plant out a bunch of them. And then I, a few years later, I graft onto those just to save money. Um, you know, the fastest way is to buy a grafted tree. Um, but you'll end up paying 20 to $25 where you can get seedlings for like $2 a piece. Um, and then rooting, rooting the softwood cuttings is another option. Um, someone asked about the living fence concept, uh, mulberry or black locust. So I, I've, I've done that both with black locust, like planting um, for replacement fence posts, and I'm experimenting with willow. I think they all will do great, um, and the best would probably be a mixture of, of several species, including mulberry. Um, you'll get different nutrients and, um, and have a more diverse supply. Um, you don't need more than one. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Would you recommend um, like using multiple of the species when creating your, your orchard, male and female of each? Or obviously you can buy them for specific reasons, but is the more diversity like better or will it hinder the purpose? Um, so the... You don't need a male tree to get fruit. Um, the fruit will actually be seedless if, uh, if there aren't any males present. Although it's, it's wind pollinated, so it can blow in from anywhere. Um, but 
I, if you're going for fruit production, you might as well just do all females. Um, and yeah, it's nice to have a diversity of cultivars just in that longer ripening window and different flavors and all that. But there's no need to have a male. Um, the pollen can actually be sort of noxious. There's a, a ton of pollen and it bothers some people's allergies. Um, and a cool fact that the male flowers release the pollen at half the speed of sound. Um, so it really like explodes it out into the air. It can be hard to tell what kind of mulberry, if you already have one on your farm, um, I check out that North Carolina um, article on comparing rubra to alba. Um, but again, if it's, if it's sort of a mature tree, you can look at the bark and the, like the fissures between the bark on a alba will be the sort of like orangish yellow color. Um, and it just looks, it looks sort of yellow generally. The roots are super yellow. Whereas with the rubra, the bark is, is darker. Um, alba again has these like really glossy bright green leaves and rubra has sort of a duller green, a uh, little bit of hairiness on the leaf. Um, but telling the specific cultivar, um, if it's a wild tree, it's probably just a seedling. Um, and so, you know, it won't, it won't have a name. Um, in the chat, someone's asking about uh, propagating from male and female trees. Um, so what I do is I, I find the female trees that I like the fruit from. In the winter, you cut off um, the little shoots of like one year old growth um, and you can store it in like a Ziploc bag in your, in your refrigerator um, until um, early summer. And then you graft onto the males um, by cutting them down. And uh, you'll have to watch a video on how to do a bark inlay graft. But then you can convert the male into a female in that way. Um, so if you have fruit that you like growing in the neighborhood or on a tree, you can use that to propagate to other trees. Um, and often they do the best, like the local cultivars um, are obviously well adapted to your situation, so they're worth growing. So the rootstock, the gender of the rootstock doesn't matter? It's just the Once you graft over it, it doesn't matter, but any, any branches that come out from like below the graft will still be the old variety. Um, so you can either just keep pruning those off or you know, if you let those get a, get away, they'll they'll continue to be the male, the male flowers and all that. Okay.